morning. All right, guys, if you got your Bibles and pray that you do, if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and, um, and while you are, while you're going there, you know, each week I'm kind of going through the alphabet, and because uh, some of you uh, still getting to know the Beaver family and, and what we're all about, and uh, so I wanted to share with you um, just a little bit about the Something I love with the letter E, okay, E, and, um, and E actually stands for elephants. I, I like elephants. I collect them, okay, and in fact, we've got some pictures. You got those pictures? And um, of some of my collection, I had to be careful. Um, um, and any, anybody else had any problem with stink bugs and us, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I took a picture, three pictures this morning, and I noticed in the third one um, that there was a dead stink bug, you know, next to one of my elephants. So, but um, hey, I've actually had opportunity to uh, travel some on some mission trips uh, around the world, and, and wherever I go, I always uh, pick up um, some elephants and uh, uh, different kinds. Uh, I've been to some of these are from Myanmar. Some of these are from India. I don't know if you can see it, but this one is actually an elephant within, within the elephant, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I, this one is the same thing. And uh, they've made from all different kinds of woods and stone. And, and uh, man, I just, uh, that's just a part of my collection. But man, I really, this is something I think is cool and uh, that I've uh, uh, collect and gets to... Uh, you know, stink bugs give their lives in front of them, you know, and, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so E stands for elephant. So next week we'll look at elf. Philippians chapter two, we're going to read verses one through four. If you would just stand in honor of God's word. And as we stand, you know, we're just recognizing that God's word is infallible and errant and then has authority over my life. And we want to honor that word. And, um, uh, and so verse 1 says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Father, I just uh, pray that you will bless the Word of God, God, this morning. Uh, Lord, it's your Word, and God, it does have authority over our life. And Father, I pray that you would teach us and that your Holy Spirit, God, would, uh, Lord, just please do a, a good work in our hearts so that we leave here differently, Father, than we came in. And so, Lord, bless it. Thank you for the service so far. And, uh, Lord, I pray that the Word of God would just be spoken boldly in this place, that you would accompany it with your signs and wonders. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. And y'all may be seated. I don't know if anybody loves Christmas like Candy Beaver loves Christmas, okay? All right? And, um, and um, you know, she's the only person that I know of that, you know, her birthday is over in January, that when we, hey, when we hit her birthday this past year that says, you know what I want for Christmas? I want a Christmas tree, a, a specific kind of Christmas tree with lights that do things. And so she got that, and she's been enjoying that Christmas tree. I'll just be honest with you, for several weeks now, in our house and um and so each year we buy a few decorations hey i know that y'all are interested my 2020 uh covid ornament from china did come in <laughs> this past week and uh we we're all excited about that and so we got it out with gloves on and put it on our tree and um but uh one of the things that candy loves about christmas is she loves christmas movies you like christmas movies what's one of your favorite movies Guys, y'all tell me, tell me a Christmas movie you like, right over here. Anybody? Are y'all going to be quiet on me? 
Fred, tell me a Christmas movie that you like. You like a, you got a Christmas movie? You don't? You like Elf? You ever seen that Christmas movie? You need to watch that Christmas movie. That's, that's my wife's favorite Christmas movie, okay? It's Elf, all right? Hey, you in the back back there, you got one? Oh, I thought you were telling her what yours was, all right? And what's that? Home Alone. Home Alone. You know, how many of y'all actually think Die Hard is a, a Christmas movie? No, that's not a Christmas movie. Eldon, you got one, man? What's that? Okay, green, all the Grinches. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, that's, that's a good one, that's a good one. And um, one, of the, one of those movies in which uh, it actually began as a book that was written in like 1843, uh, was written by Charles Dickens uh, called A Christmas Story. And it's the, it's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, and, um, who is, uh, uh, man, he's just mean in the beginning, and he's very selfish and, and grumpy, um, you know, and, and, and the story goes along that he is visited by four ghosts. One is his former business partner, Jacob Marley. And then the ghost of Christmas past comes and the ghost of Christmas present and Christmas yet to come. And so, and, and, and after these visits, you know, there at the end, we see almost like, almost like uh, um, the Grinch, you know, there at the end when his heart grows and he changes, we see the same thing in Ebenezer Scrooge and, Scrooge, and he becomes this very generous and very kind man. And um, so, and I, I thought about that as I began to, to uh, look at this passage this week because you and I are a lot like Scrooge, you know? You know, we've been visited by a spirit, but it, which is real, called the Holy Spirit. Man, and He has come and He has changed and He has transformed our hearts and our lives, you know, through the work of Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful thing that that is and uh, how the Spirit transforms us. And not only is it just, he, he transforms us and, and He's transformed the church altogether. And, and that's really the point that I think that Paul is trying to make in the passage that we read this morning that... I mean, you, you wouldn't think that Paul would have to talk about, you know, um, the church so much getting along. You wouldn't think so. Man, you would think that we would be all excited about Jesus and, and His work and His love for us and this wonderful gospel that we have to share with the world that we would not let anything whatsoever mess that up. But yet Paul has to talk a lot about the church getting along, and the church having unity, and the church coming together. I, I very jokingly was talking to Brother Paul this morning, and he was telling him about his son was getting ready to go to a particular church, and I'm like, well, you need to tell him to stay away from those Unity Baptist churches, because, man, you know, usually there's a reason why they called it Unity, because somebody wouldn't get along, or our, our Fellowship Baptist Church, and then down the road is New Fellowship Baptist Church, because that first fellowship wouldn't work out so much, you know? And, uh, but man, Paul talks a lot, and here we see it again. That here in the book of Philippians, as he's talking to this church that he loves very dearly, he, he spills a lot of ink in chapter 2 here about unity, coming together, you and me, who are so different in many ways, coming together for the sake of the gospel. And I want to remind you where we've been. And, you know, and, and it really begins back in verse 27. Verse 27 is really a key turning point in the book of Philippians. And this is where Paul said this, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit, there's that unity again, and with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so you and I are, are, are to live out this gospel and, and, and which you know, declares to us that Jesus has died and He has redeemed these, these, these sinners that were worthy of God's wrath, but man... We, he's redeemed us. What a wonderful thing that is. And now we live out of that gospel. 
You know, and from that life, you and I experience this joy that you can't experience outside of salvation that, that as the, the Wibbler family told us about last week. And man, wasn't that a precious prayer she led us in last week? Man, just really all about what joy is about. That's something that you and I can only experience in Christ Jesus. The, the, the world can't experience true joy. They may think, they may call it joy, but man, we get to know the joy that's found in Jesus. One of my former professors, Ligon Duncan, said about this passage, he said that the key to experiencing that God intended joy in the congregation of believers is a God-centered, gospel-based, grace-enabled shifting of our attention away from ourselves and onto others in which we aim to manifest and maintain our spiritual unity given us by the grace of Christ and we strive together to slay pride and purpose to serve one another in self-denying and self-giving love. That's, that's what this passage that we talked about this morning and we read is all about. Man, it's, it's about experiencing this gospel and then spending the rest of your life dying to yourself and just sharing forth the love that Christ has put in your life and my life. And so in this passage, Paul gives this earnest plea, come together for the sake of the gospel. Be unified for the sake of the gospel. But listen to this. Guys, he's really not asking us to create unity. He's just asking us to acknowledge the unity that Christ has created. Listen, you know, I think sometimes we try to spend too much time together trying to create unity in a church. When what we really need to do is acknowledge the unity that Christ has already put together. See, Christ has done something in your heart and in my heart that, 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 that makes us very unique. The body of Christ, the church, is much different than any organization that could ever be put together. So God has made us, male and female, you know, Jew and Greek, one in Jesus Christ. And, and so as we rest and we trust in Him and we're united to Him, then we, you know, something supernaturally happens. We become united to each other, okay? And what Apostle Paul is saying is live that out. Live out that unity. You know, we, you and I, when we come together being different, when we come together and we're unified around the gospel, around Jesus, man, you know, we're showing forth how great our God is and how wonderful the salvation is. And so basically what Paul is saying is don't mess that up, okay? All right? Because it's so easy for us all, including myself, to mess up the unity that God wants us to have or disrupt it by being selfish or self-centered or by having thinking that your kingdom is bigger than his kingdom and, 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 and you, you, you want to do your own agenda. So, so listen, what we do as a church, what you do on Wednesday night with all of these kids, what we do as a church, my friend, is out of the gospel. And it's for the sake of the gospel. Now listen, Paul knows that change is intrinsic. That's a big word that means it comes from the inside. See, one of the things I teach, you know, and at, at the prison in my reentry class, I try to tell guys, you know, change has got to come from your inside. You know, and, and, and so Paul knows that. And so it must come from the inside out. It begins in the heart, and it, then it flows out of the life. And just like, just like the Grinch, and I like the Grinch better. I think it's a great whose heart had to be changed, you know. Your heart and my heart was changed. And, and out of that change comes, you know, a, a life. And so we're changed from the inside out. And, and so sometimes we have to be reminded, do we not, of the gospel. And sometimes we have to be reminded what God has intended for us to be. Because we forget it. It leaks out of us, okay? So what I'm going to do here, uh, we're going to come back to verse 1. But we're going to begin in verse 2 in what I call the heart of the matter, okay? You know, listen to what he says in verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. This is the heart of the matter. Now, now all these verses, all the, the four verses that we read to you is actually 
one sentence, okay? All right? And in that one sentence is one command, all right? And the command that Paul is telling them, he says, complete my joy, okay? And there's a couple of things that that, 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 that tells me. One, it reminds you again that Paul is serious about joy, that you and I have joy. And I think it's interesting. We're in Christmas and, and we, we sing joy to the world, you know. Paul is very much in tune with you and I having this joy. And, and listen, when you begin to look at that verse, and when he says, complete my joy, it's in, in the Greek it's really interesting because it's almost like he said, hey, do this without delay. Make sure this happens. You know, complete my joy. There, there's a sense of urgency in verse 2, okay? Um, William's translation pictures the thrust of Paul's desire. When he translated this passage, this is what he says. Fill up my cup of joy and do this now. He, see, Paul knows, like any pastor, you know, of any church, of any congregation, that the, you know, the, the church coming together, nothing breaks a pastor's heart worse than when he starts to see divide in the church. When he starts seeing factions in the church. When he, when he starts seeing us not being on the same page. I mean, it, it tears a pastor up because, you see, when, when we have disunity, what suffers is the mission of the church, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and, 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 and there's been many of argument, maybe when you or somebody else won the argument, but the gospel was lost. And we don't want that. And so Paul is very much, he's like, listen guys, complete my joy by having being of one mind, being together, having this unity. You see, Paul had already found a lot of joy with them, you know, and, and that's something else that this verse tells us, that he found much joy in what was going on in the congregation there at Philippi. But now he's like, make my joy complete. Fill my cup up with this joy and, 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 and fill it to the brim. And the way you're going to do that is you maintain this unity that God has given us and be of one man, my mind. And so he commands them, you know, to to not only come together, but have the same heart, the same mentality, and the same mind. And, and think about this, guys. This unity is in the midst of great diversity, okay? And listen, unity is not the absence of diversity. Unity, my friend, is something that God gives. Unity is not uniformity, okay? All right? You know, last week when Garrett and Amanda and Miss Debbie were up here singing, wasn't that wonderful harmony, right? You know, and, and they were all singing different parts. I can't sing harmony. I just sing, okay? That's all I know to do. And if somebody says, well, will you hit that? No, I don't know parts, and, and I can't do that at all. Maybe if I were taught. But isn't it wonderful when you've got different parts being sung and it comes together and it's harmony? And that's the way it is here, you know. And, and, and uh, God is bringing people who are different, like you and me, and He's bringing us together in unity, and, and only He can do that. Now, how do you do that? I mean, how does God do that? And how, what can we work on in order to have this unity that, that He speaks of? Well, the first thing that He says, this is straight out of the Scripture, Complete my joy by being of the same mind. You know, having the same mind. Now, they need to be on the same page. You know, this is in the present tense, which calls that this needs to be a habitual mindset for you and me. That we're always striving to be of the same mind. Now, that doesn't mean that we've got to think about the same stuff the same way all the time. Okay, not, that's not what it's saying. Now, I know some of you love the color orange and you love this school over in Knoxville called the University of Tennessee, okay? All right? Cool. Some of you like blue. I figured that out. You like blue and, and you like that school up in, in Kentucky and especially Kentucky basketball and, and that's, that's where you go. Personally, myself, I'm a maroon and white kind of guy, Mississippi State 
all the way through and actually traveled uh, you know, last weekend to watch them play against Ole Miss and we lost. But, but guys, but, but he's not asking us to root. All of us root for one team. That's not what we're talking about here. When he says, have the same mind. And I'm thankful because I am not going to root for the University of Kentucky ever. Okay, all right? That's just, I, I just it's not going to happen. But what he is saying is that we're to have the same mind. And if we follow through in chapter 2, he says the word mind again. And by the way, it's the mind of Christ. Okay? They, he wants us to have the mind of Christ, the same attitude that Christ would have, the same disposition that Christ would have, the same outlook that Christ would have. And, 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 you know, if you go over to John 17, you get a glimpse of, of really what that outlook looks like. What, what was Jesus all about? In and, and John 17, you have what's called the high priestly prayer. And, and it's really interesting. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed the same night that He was betrayed. Right before His death, He prays. And you know what He does? He prays for you and me. And, and listen to what He pray, prayed for us. Lord, let them be one like you and I are one. Ain't that, ain't, that, ain't that crazy that Jesus would pray that? That's what His outlook was. And so Jesus is deeply concerned for the church to be unified, coming together, because this is what He knows. And He says this, Let them be one so that the world will know that you've sent Me. Listen to me. We, when we are one and we're going forth in the same mind, with the same goals, my friend, of the gospel and Jesus above all, that I tell you what, the world gets to know who our Savior is and that who He really is, my friend. And so we should have that same mind. And so Paul is exhorting us to do exactly what Jesus prayed for in John 17. Have that same mind. Be like-minded. Have the same mindset of Christ. And man, we're going to even get deeper in that next week as we look at the verses following this. But not only we're to have the same mind, my friend, in this unity, but we're to have, my friend, the same love. The same love. That's the heart. The same love. By the way, the word love there is agape. And it's the same word for the love that God has for you. One is unconditional. One, two, He chooses to love. He chooses to love us. My friend, it's... it's that it's not ushy gushy kind of love, you know, sentimentality or anything like that. No, that's not the kind of love that God has for you. My friend, the kind of love that God has for you, He chooses to love you and He loves you and me unconditionally. I'm so thankful for that, you know, because there's no conditions to His love. He just loves me. Now, hear this out. You and I are to have the same love for each other, okay? You to love me choosing to love me. And I'm just going to tell you, some of y'all don't know me very well, but there's going to, have to, there's going to be some times that you're going to have to choose to love me, all right? Because I'm a little rough around the edges sometimes, all right? And, and I know that. And I'm working on that, and Jesus is working on me, and He's smoothing those things out. But guys, but until I get glorified, you may have to just choose to love me at some point. And same thing with me, you to me, okay? But guys, when you do that, that's, you're having the same agape love that, that Jesus has for you. And that's the kind of love that we need to have for each other, okay? That even though we may be a little weird at times, and even though we may be a little cranky at some, guys, we choose to love each other. And it isn't, it's not conditional, you know? And so if Paul ever, you know, stops, you know, and, and he... he, he I'm always going to love him. That's the way the Bible says that we're to do it. And he used to love me the same way. A guy by the name of Tertullian. He, man, he was an early church father. And he, he was in the church just right after Jesus was here on this earth. And he described this love as, as our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Whereas our opponents will say, look how they love one another. Look how they're prepared to die for one another. That's the kind of love that we need to have.
for each other, that we're willing to die for each other, that, that we're willing to live for each other and serve one another. That's the love. It's the same love that God has for you. You're to have for other people. And uh, remember that, okay? Then the third thing that we see in this heart of the unity, you know, because our hearts have to be changed and all of this life is lived out of the heart is we have the same purpose. Look what he says there at the end. Having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind. Being in full accord means you set your mind or heart upon something. That, 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 that your heart is set to it so much so that your actions follow it. You're, you're intensely chasing after it. You are, it's like a laser-guided missile. Your focus on one purpose, one thing. Being a full accord, one mind. That you're, you're focused so much on it that it changes how you talk. Man, it changes how you live your life. And, and Paul lets us in on what God's purpose is. You know, if we're all going to be laser-focused on what we're supposed to be on. What is that? Well, Paul talks about that in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, where he says, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose. Okay? Here it is. Which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Here it is. To unite all things in Him. Who's Him? Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth. You know what God's purpose is? He's bringing everything in the world under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, my friend. In other words, He's uniting all who believe in Christ. He's putting us together as one family, one body, one, pimp, one people, not one pimple. I don't know where that came from. Because we're one people, you know, and here's the deal. We're, we're one so that Jesus' name can be exalted. And, and, and it could be all about Jesus. And so... When he tells us that we're to be of one accord, of one mind, my friend, our, we're living our life, laser guided missile type of living, and our purpose is to glorify Jesus Christ and Him only, my friend, with our life. And, and so that, that's what that's the heart of it. But you know what? There's some things that can mess that up. There's some things that can derail the church and derail you and me. And he talks about that in verses 3 and 4. Things like selfish ambition, conceit, looking out for your own interest. You know, we can come and get sidetracked with our own agendas and our own desires. And, and can I just say, am I the only one? I can be really selfish at times. And so Paul is calling them and he's calling you and me to die to that. Why? So that Jesus can be exalted. So that He can be lifted up. So that the focus can be on Him. And so what does that lead to? You know, this, this heart of the matter leads to just humble living. Look, I call it the, the humility of the makeover, you know? That, that, uh, this makeover that God has, has done when He saved us and He redeemed us. Look what He says here, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Man, man, it's so easy to think about yourself. Man, I mean, we're born into this world thinking about ourselves. You don't have to teach your kid how to be selfish. Let's let them have a dirty diaper and they'll let you know all about it. You know that it's about them. But guys, but, but so how do we kill this selfish ambition? I mean, how do we kill it? Where we feel that, you know, um, where we feel that we, we've got, you know, that's what selfish ambition is. It's, it's this feeling that you've got to one-up everybody, you know, that you've got to do better than everybody else. Listen, I used to pastor a church in Mississippi down in, called Mount Horeb, okay? And, and it's kind of interesting. We had a house, and across the road from our house, was this cemetery. Now Mount Horeb was an interesting church and, and, um, and because you know there was a lot of widow ladies in that church. I mean, just for some reason, I don't know if they were killing their husbands off or what, you know, but there was a lot of widow ladies in that church. Now it may be because they were all really good cooks and, and, and you know, just probably fattened their husbands up, but, but one of the things about this church 
in general was people loved to one-up each other. They loved it. If one got a swimming pool, everybody had a swimming pool. If one man got him a motorcycle, every man would go get a motorcycle. But one of the things that, that really struck me was in that cemetery across the road is how those ladies would decorate their husband's graves. And Christmas, I tell you what, there'd be candles out there. There would be there a change of flowers. and I mean, they just seemed like everybody was trying to one-up the other, you know, and in the midst of it. And that's kind of weird, you know. I mean, to come across, we would come back from town at night, and usually we're used to seeing this dark cemetery across from our house, and you start seeing these lights, you know, or lanterns and, and candles and things of that nature that people would, would do for their loved ones. But, but, you know, that's what he means by selfish ambition. But here's the deal. The fact of the matter is, is that Jesus has put all of us in our place, right? Man, he is, He's come along and there's nothing... There's nothing that I could ever do to one-up Jesus. My friend, nothing gets better than Jesus, God in the flesh, dying for you and me like He did. And so therefore, I, I, you know what? We Boswell, when he says, let nothing be done by selfish ambition, guys, listen, nothing that you will ever do will ever one-up Jesus. And by the way, it really puts us all on a level field, doesn't it? You know, because all of us were in need of grace and we were shown grace by our God and He saved us by His grace. He gave us something that we absolutely didn't deserve. And so therefore, we don't need to go through life with selfish ambition, trying to one-up, trying to be better, trying to, to live for our little kingdoms. And then He says something else. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Some of your translations uh, has vain glory. Let nothing be done through vain glory or vain conceit in some other versions. Let's see, let nothing be done through empty glory. That's what va- vain means empty. That's a glory that doesn't exist. Listen, listen, when you and I get conceited, listen, we you're literally getting conceited for nothing because. Let me just tell you and me something. You and I don't have any glory. Our glory is vain glory. Okay? It's empty. So listen, we really need to get over ourselves. Johnny needs to get over himself. Listen, we get concerned with a glory that's empty and nothing. So where selfish ambition is thinking, man, I've got to beat them, Vain glory is the sore loser when you don't, you know? Guys, it's about appearance and the saving face. Listen, you and I don't have to do that because you and I are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. We're covered with His righteousness. Nothing's better than that. So let me ask you, do you compare yourself to others? Do you get bitter when you don't measure up? Do you struggle with envy and jealousy and anger and malice? Do you you find yourself despising other people? Do do you get excited when others get theirs, you know, when when they get what's coming to them? See, that's vainglory. Don't live for that. Listen, the opposite of this is the person of Christ. You see, let me tell you this. Jesus doesn't have vainglory. Jesus has glory, glory. Amen? You see, when you live for Him... You're glorifying the one who is full of glory. You see, he had all glory, and he and 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 down in the scripture right below that, this one who had all glory, listen to this, made himself nothing for you and me, for our sake. And, and according to this, the way that you kill empty conceit. And the way that you kill selfish ambition, the way that you and I kill that is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there will never be unity in the congregation apart from gospel humility when you and I as believers just recognize all that Jesus Christ has done for us at Calvary and we die to ourselves. Look what he said in Romans 12. 
He told them, he says, live in harmony with one another. There's another one. Those people in Rome weren't getting along. He says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Don't be prideful. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. He's calling us to humility. You see, a humble person contributes to the unity of the church. A humble person is not worried about who gets the glory. A humble person is not worried about who gets the credit. You see, that's the heart of gospel of a gospel-centered church because it's all about Jesus Christ. So Paul goes on and gives us this amazing picture of Jesus in verses 6 to 11. And, and really, don't you see the ultimate picture of humility? That Jesus, who had every right to be conceited, what did He do? He emptied Himself and He became like us. And there's our model for humility. John Stott said, In every aspect of the Christian life, pride is our greatest foe and humility our greatest ally. In every aspect of the Christian life, no matter what we're doing, pride is always an enemy to us. Let me tell you what, where I've gotten myself in trouble the most is in pride. It's always an enemy. Humility is always our greatest friend. And Paul says, cultivate that. And, and by the way, the, the way he does it is actually where we're going to talk about next week in the verses. He says, look at Jesus. If you want to cultivate humility, gospel humility, what it, right, it, hey, behold Jesus, because when you behold Jesus, you're beholding what humility looks like. And, and man, what a wonderful thing. You know, and, and so... So that, that, that's where it begins. So, so this makeover in our lives that models Christ, it should be one that we are counting others more significant than ourselves. Guys, if we're following Jesus, if we're following His example, if we're loving like we're supposed to, if we are having the same mind and things of that nature, guys, look what He says, count. The word count there means think carefully about it. Okay? Think carefully about it. Take careful thought. Count others more significant than yourself. And so when I look at Gene and, and I look at his life, that doesn't mean that I think that I'm an awful person and, and have an Eeyore you know, uh, walk about myself. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking up to him. I'm encouraging him. Man, I, I think more of him that I'm thinking about myself. Somebody was once said, and actually this has actually been said that, that C.S. Lewis said it and, and Tim Keller I know has said it. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. You know, so that you're not self-focused and, and, and you're not all about you. And so to be sure that we don't misunderstand him, Paul kind of doubles down in verse 4. And, and he says, hey, Hey, count others more significant than yourselves. And then he says, here it is. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see, the root problem of all of this, here it is. Guys, we love ourselves. And, and here, we make idols of ourselves. Isn't that the original sin, Adam and Eve? When the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, what did he say? You will be like who? God. And every moment that we're operating out of selfish ambition, you know, trying to one-up everybody else, every moment when I am being conceited with vain conceit, every time that I think that I'm better than anybody else, every time that I'm looking to my interests and not on the interests of others, Basically, you know what I'm saying? I am God to myself. Come and worship at my feet. But you know what? The Gospel comes along and it shows us that we're nothing more than sinners unable to save ourselves. Therefore, we must look to another, Jesus Christ, and we are to take the mindset and we're to treat others the way that we've been treated by Him in love and agape love. And, and, and what does that do? It causes us to look out for the well-being of others. We serve others. 
We consider others. You know, we, we, we don't just... Service is not just something that we do. From We become servants all the time. Servants. You know, and so we set aside our personal checklist to serve others. That's why when we go shopping over the next week and we're thinking about these backpacks, hey, we're, we're going to think of others. We're going to think of kids. We're going to think about their families. Why? Because Christ thought of us, loved us, died for us. So, so you, you do all these things because they've been done to you, which is my third point going back to verse 1. And I call it the heat of the motive. Why do we do this? Listen to what Paul said. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Now, understand this. Paul said this long before he says, complete my joy being one mind, having one love, being of, have, being of one accord and one mind. He says this before he ever says, you know, think about others more than you think about yourselves. Don't have, have vain conceit. Don't, don't have selfish ambition. He says this before he says any of that. Why? Because... Paul knows before he exhorts, he needs to inform. And the information that he gives us here tells us why we should do all that stuff that we just mentioned. You see, to give exhortation without this vital information really makes us under a burden, you know? I mean, it just sounds like he's telling us to do a lot of things. But there's a reason why we do it. You see, the reason why you and I humble ourselves and we serve other people and, and we serve each other and we love one another it's because of all this stuff has been done to us and so Paul opens with a series of if there is any encouragement in Christ if there's been any comfort from love any participation in the spirit any affection and sympathy now Paul is not saying here you know like hey this were possibilities really the way he writes it is these are certainties these are certainties that we all have experienced and we need to be reminded of that. And so in closing, guys, let me just remind you of what Christ has done for you. Look what He says here. You've been encouraged in Christ. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, the word encouragement is paracleses. Um, the Holy Spirit is actually called the paraclete or the comforter. And I, I, I didn't hit spell check there, did I? You know, but but listen, calling it the encouragement is calling to one side for the purpose of comfort and consolation and exhortation and encouragement. Listen to what he's telling them. He's telling them, Philippians, you're sure blessed in Christ Jesus. Man, you've been encouraged by him. Think about what he's done for you. Man, He has comforted you. Man, He's given you the gift of faith. Man, He, listen, nothing should lift your spirit than the fact that Jesus Christ has died for you and He loves you and, and He's never going to start loving you. And even in the midst of trial and suffering, you can always find encouragement in Christ Jesus. Amen? What a wonderful thing. You've all, if you're a believer here today, you've been encouraged by Jesus Christ, haven't you? And then he, he says there in the next one, you, you, if there's, you've had any comfort from love, and, and in what he's saying there is you have the consolation of love. You know, and it's that love that, that every single day that I know that He loves me, that He is ours and we are His. What a comfort that it is that He mutually loves me and then there's nothing I can ever do to mess that up, you know? And there's nothing I could ever do to make Him love me more than He loves me right now. And there's nothing I could ever do to make Him love me less than He loves me right now because He loves me perfectly in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul told the church at Philippi in chapter 1, 7 and 8 that he loves them with the affection of Jesus Christ because he knows God's love. He knows Jesus' love. 
And my friend, you've been loved with that agape love. And he reminds us of that. Not only that, number three, we share in the fellowship with the Spirit. You know, any participation in the Spirit there. The Greek word for translated fellowship is koinonia. It's the same word that you see in chapter 1, verse 5. That this Holy Spirit, this koinonia, my friend, unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, it's the Spirit that helps us when we're weak, that prays for us when we don't know what to pray for. That same Spirit unites us together. Guys, you and I have been blessed with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God. What a wonderful thing. This fellowship that we have is a Spirit-produced fellowship. But then last, he says, we share in affection and sympathy or mercy there at the end of that verse. This affection or tenderness. Listen, Jesus tenderly loves you. Guys, all of this flows out of the fact that you are united in Christ Jesus. Man, Christ loves us with amazing tenderness and affection and mercy. And you and I share in that. You see, before He ever asks us to be humble and serve one another, before He asks us to, be, to die to ourselves and, and not chase after vainglory and, and selfish ambition, He reminds us that you have been loved with a love that's so wonderful. I thought about the song that Gary and them sang last week, How Many Kings. I mean, seriously. How many kings of this earth would step down from their thrones for their people? Guys, how many lords would abandon their homes? But Jesus did. How many greats have become the least for me? How, how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that's all torn apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. My friend, He loves you. And because He loves us, that's the heat. That's the fire. My friend, it should cause you and me now to go die to ourselves and go live for others. Let me ask you something. What do you want for Christmas? Let me remind you that the greatest Christmas present ever given, sounds corny, is Jesus Christ. And, and God is asking you and I to make Jesus big by allowing yourself to become small. Let's make Jesus big by allowing ourselves to become small. What John the Baptist says, let him increase that I and let me decrease so that he increases. And, and we do that by considering others, doing for others. And let me tell you this: when you and I do that, we die to ourselves, we serve other people. When we do that, we serve each other, something happens. The gospel is advanced, and Jesus is glorified. What a wonderful thing. So, so what do we do with all of this? Okay, here's the so what. I forgot to do this the last couple of weeks. But, but guys, so here's the thing. What are some practical things that you can do to keep what Christ has done for you in front of you daily? You know, I mean, think about that. Because see, this leaks out of us and we forget, man, how wonderful your salvation is. So what are some practical things that you can do daily to keep in front of you what Jesus has done for you, okay? Guys, number two, how tuned are you into God's purposes being fulfilled on this earth? Are you all about Jesus being glorified and magnified? What are you doing in your life that exalts Christ right now? Number three, do you love people the way God has loved you? And what does that look like in your life? Number four, do you struggle with envy, jealousy, anger, or malice because you keep seeing the successes of, or joys of others and compare them with your own perceived or actual failures? Do you find yourself despising other people? Do you get excited when somebody gets theirs? Then maybe you need to repent and, and think about how you've been loved. Number five, how do you think of others better than yourself? And what does that look like in your life? 
And how are you putting their interest in front of your own? Because that's what Christ has called us about. Listen, the reason why we waited to do the Lord's Supper at the end is because we need to be reminded of this. Guys, we need to be reminded. Gene, if y'all just come up.